to understand the energies that we are going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, we get into a bit of a complex subject at this point. In order to understand the, uh, the importance of sexual energy and the vitality of love, the creativity that is peculiar to our existence on this planet. And let me see if I can build a background by going back to the Bible. Did you enjoy what we did with the Bible last night? Okay, so we'll go back to that as a source for understanding this energy. There was um, one of the twelve apostles of Jesus Christ who was a um, rather spectacular being. He sort of stands out from all the others. And he tried to write of his experience with Christ. There were four of the followers of Christ who wrote books about him, brief biographies called the Gospels. Three of those record the events that happened in Jesus' life, but the fourth one is an esoteric Gospel. He didn't want to write a chain of events. He didn't want to write a biography. He wanted to pass on the essence of what Christ was all about. So he tried to explain the message itself instead of the, uh, just the events, the recording of events. And that's the book of John. This particular apostle is probably the deepest, the most esoteric of all of the apostles in his understanding of what Christ was trying to convey. His book, the Gospel of John, begins this way. In the King James Version, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And this Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this same, the Word, was in the beginning with God, and all things were created by him, this word. And without him was nothing made that was made. Now, that's the first uh, four verses, I think, or maybe six verses of the Gospel of John that I've just quoted. And that's, um, that's a little deep if you leave it at that level, so let's take it apart and see if we can break it down. But Greek was the spoken language of the time, and from the manuscripts that are available, it would appear that he wrote it in Greek, especially because he was sending it to Greek people. So there's very good reason for thinking that that's the original language. So he says, in the beginning was the word. Now, he wasn't using English, so he didn't use the word word. What he did use was the word logos. In the beginning was the Logos. Logos means expression. Now that doesn't mean that using the word word was wrong. It just means that they could have said expression instead of word. When you translate a word from Greek into English, there are a lot of different options. You could say it's word, you could say it's expression. Expression probably fits best. And if you use the word expression, it comes across differently. It says, in the beginning, God expressed himself. Okay? In the beginning was the expression of God. And the expression of God was God. God was expressing himself in the beginning, and out of this expression of himself was everything made that was made. And nothing was made out of anything else other than this expression of God. Now does it make sense? Now the importance of that is to try to understand what this expression of God is. When God expresses himself, what is the resultant energy or mass or matter? What is it that God expresses? John, the same writer, says a little bit later in the same book, God is love. The two terms are synonymous. Now, taking this writing of his, we could say 
In the beginning, there was an energy, just one. That one energy we can call love. Love is God expressing himself. Everything that was made was made out of this energy called love. Love energy is energy that can penetrate anything, can move through time and space without loss of energy. Now, to try to illustrate this another way, this energy that we're talking about, because we're going to talk about this energy a lot this afternoon, and the, the greater understanding we can get of it, the better the understanding of the workshop will work. So try to get a handle on this energy. In order to take that a little further, I'd like to tell you about an experiment that happened in Soviet Russia a few years ago in which some baby rabbits were taken away from a mother rabbit. Have you heard about it? The mother rabbit was connected to a biofeedback machine and the baby rabbits were killed. Every time a baby rabbit was killed, the mother rabbit reacted and they could record her reaction on biofeedback equipment. So they wondered what kind of energy is it that is communicated from a baby rabbit to the mother rabbit at the moment of death? Is this some kind of electromagnetic energy? Is, a, is it a biomagnetic energy? What kind of force are we dealing with? In order to isolate this force, in order to see what kind of principles it obeys, what laws govern it, they took baby rabbits to the bottom of the ocean in a submarine 500 miles from the location of the mother rabbit. And with the mother rabbit connected to a biofeedback machine, again, they killed baby rabbits. Now, 500 miles away, through water, through the walls of the submarine, and through lead-lined walls, the energy was still communicated, and the mother rabbit reacted. And the scientists did everything that they could do to figure out what kind of an energy could possibly do that, because there is no known energy, no measurable force that has ever had that capacity. They also noted that there was no time lapse. It didn't take seconds for the signal from the dying baby rabbit to get to the mother rabbit. It happened simultaneously. So it traveled through time, space, and matter with no loss of velocity, no time lapse, and without any weakening of force that could be detected. What kind of an energy can do that? A couple of years after that experiment occurred, I met Christopher Bird, who was one of the writers who reported that experiment. And he was really curious about that energy. So he asked me to do a reading for him. And in that reading, his principal question was, what kind of an energy was that that was communicated from the baby rabbit to the mother rabbit or from the mother rabbit to the baby rabbit? What kind of a bond allowed that kind of thing to happen that we can't measure, that we, that we can't describe by any of our physical laws, that physics can't explain what kind of an energy? And the source chose to call that Logoidal energy. There is no such word. Or at least there wasn't until the source used the term. The energy of the logos, the energy of the expression of God that all things are made out of, and they explained it this way. They said, the mother rabbit is made out of that. The original energy was turned into a plasm. A plasm is a still energy that forms matter that things can be formed out of. So there was energy first, and then there was plasm, the available substance of that energy. Then everything that was made was made out of that plasm of logoidal energy. So the mother rabbit was literally made out of it. The baby rabbit was made out of it. The submarine was made out of it. Therefore, it had no resistance to it. The ocean was made out of it. Time and space are made out of it. There is nothing that can resist it. It is the supreme energy, the prime energy 
in the universe, the most powerful force that exists, because everything that is matter, everything of which time and space is made, is made out of the result of that energy. Nothing can resist it. Nothing has any force against it. Logoidal energy, again, is love. That's what it is. The source also explained that it wasn't as if you have a mother rabbit here and a baby rabbit there, separated by all of this time and space. But rather, when you take cells out of something made of logoidal energy, when you take cells out of that and separate it by distance, there is no real separation. There is like a cord. There is a commonality that forms a bond between them. So it's impossible to separate a baby rabbit from a mother rabbit in that sense. They're never really separate. There is a common bond that flows through. There is a cord from the source of the energy to the result of the energy. So that there is an aka cord from you to your mother, from you to your parents, from you to anyone with whom you have exchanged body energy including from you to everyone that you have ever had a sexual encounter with. You will never be separated from them. Not really. There is always a link, always a bond, always a tie of energy. You can dilute that to the extent that it doesn't affect you as much as if you kept reinforcing the bond but you are affected more or less by everything that happens to anyone that you have ever had a sexual relationship with. The effect might, may be minuscule, but it's there. And you can override the effect with your own will, your own decision, your own determination, but it is still there. There is that cord and that bond that comes from the exchange of body fluids, that comes from the melding of cells, of living tissue, of the life force that is around. Now let's see if we can talk about that life force for a moment to get beyond uh, just the physical. What we're going to deal with here for a moment are what is called chakra. And um, as simply as I can illustrate this, we could say that the atmosphere around you right now is alive with logoidal energy. Now keep in mind, that energy that surrounds you right now, that's in this room, that's in the atmosphere around us, is the most potent energy in all the universe. It's just sort of hanging there like potential powerful potential, extremely powerful. Now, you have a mind which can operate a brain, not vice versa. You have a mind which can operate a brain. Your mind will cause your brain to put out electrical impulses. When your brain puts out electrical impulses, you can form images. When you form images, that logoidal energy is affected, undulated by that image. If you form an image of something that you want, some material object, that energy that is around you is perfectly capable of going to that object and causing it to come to you. That's how prayer and precipitation work. You have a creative mind, a causative mind. It causes this energy to be affected. You can send thoughts to another person by causing that energy to do what you want to do. It is available to you. It obeys you. It obeys the Creator. The only thing that can rule over this logoidal energy is the creative mind. And that is the aspect of you that is God. God set that energy in motion, and His creativity can rule over it. When the creativity that is in you, that is God, tells that energy what to do, it just does it. And that's good or bad. 
So that energy itself is life and it is love, but it can be used for good or for evil. And when you think negative thoughts toward another individual, you cause that energy to undulate in the sense of negative thoughts toward that individual. They must be strong enough to repel that and to give it a different signal if they are to survive your psychic attacks. You heard the term psychic attacks? A psychic attack is nothing more than your sending hate or thoughts of negativity toward another person. And the only thing that makes a psychic attack really effective is if the person sending it is much more effective in commanding the energy around him or her than the person receiving it. Then it can be extremely powerful, extremely deadly, can cause destruction. This energy potential around you is obedient to the cause mind. Now, when a human being occurs, what happens is that a creative mind takes this pool of energy potential and begins to move it in a spiral motion, begins to move it in a circle, and causes a sort of whirlpool of energy. Now that's the beginning of you and me. You take an egg and a sperm, two cells, a positive and a negative charge, and your creative potential causes them to start to move. And if you start that motion in a clockwise motion, you're going to build a masculine body in which you can enter. If you start to spiral in a, in a counterclockwise motion, you will build a feminine vehicle in which you can enter. But what you're doing is starting a spiraling of energy that produces an energy vortex. Now, there is no matter at this point except for the two cells that you started with and started the energy moving around them. But as this vortex starts to whirl, it begins to produce an energy whirlpool, and not until you start a second one in the opposite direction does it begin to gather cells around it. So the cells then, when you have these two playing against each other, force meeting force, resisting, then you create a magnetic field, and cells begin to accumulate, and a fetus begins to form. You will start a pool in the opposite direction again, and so on, through seven levels. Now, as these seven levels form, you form seven different capacities or abilities that are peculiar to the human. Animals have different numbers, different combinations than humans, and these seven vortices are peculiar to the human being. Each vortice here, each vortex, will form a set of, of glands that have to do, that are related to the kind of energy that is built on that level. So you have seven different pools of energy, and every other one is masculine and feminine. So that if you are masculine on the lower level, the base level, the first level, then you're feminine on the second, and masculine on the third, and so on up. And the reverse is also true, so that a man has four masculine vortexes and three feminine, and a female has four feminine and three masculine. Okay? But you are neither masculine nor feminine. You are a combination of both, giving expression on the physical to one or the other, but with the capacities of moving in either direction in communication and relationships, in giving and receiving. Now, the reason that I really want you to know about these seven vortices of energy is because that each one of them has each one has its purpose in life and forms a bond on, each, on its level. We can form a physical bond here 
on this level and even on this level. We will form an emotional bond on this level. We'll form a bond of acceptance that is beyond emotion on this level. We will form a relationship between wills, dominance or submission, on this level. We'll form a relationship of understanding on this level. And we will form a total relationship on that level. Now, most people, when they come together in a sexual relationship, meet on one of these three levels, or all three, and may blend on all three. And as a matter of fact, what you'll find interesting is that a relationship that blends on all three of these lower levels might be known in our society as a rather perfect marriage. Because it's so much more than the average marriage, which is formed here or here or both, and doesn't get beyond. If we blend on the emotional level, if we are married on the emotional level, then we have a more successful than average marriage. If we should blend and be married on four levels to the heart level, then the interesting thing that's peculiar about a heart level marriage is that there is no imprisonment. The heart level energy is an energy that says, I love you, which means I love you as you are, with your desires, inclinations, and needs. Not because of my need do I love you, nor do I require you to meet my need. I love you to the extent that I can release you to meet your needs, whatever they are without clinging, without judgment, without manipulation, without imprisoning, without holding, with utmost security in me, I love you. And that makes no requirements whatsoever upon you. Can you see how rare that kind of marriage is? Can you see how rare that kind of love is? But when love reaches that kind of level, of simple acceptance, without requirements, without manipulation, not based on need, not based on insecurity, not based on fear. When love is at that level, love doesn't get disappointed. We're afraid to love on that level because if I love on that level, I'm not holding on to anyone. There's even a feeling that if I love somebody that way, I don't love them very much when the truth is rather the opposite. It is an unselfish love that loves on that level. And the level of the will, the love that loves there says, I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to be in control. I don't have to compete my will against your will. I don't even see the separation of wills. I don't see a contest. I don't see competition. I don't fight for my rights because I don't have to. And the, the, what I'm describing on this level doesn't mean just giving in, not caring. It isn't that at all. It is the removal of fear. Jerry Jampolsky said it all rather well when he said love is letting go of fear. When there is no fear involved in my love, there is no contest of wills either. I'm not afraid to do what you want to do. I'm not afraid to go in your direction. I'm not afraid that I won't be fulfilled if you are, because I know that it's not a contest between the two. If a marriage happens on six levels, there is total communication between the two individuals. It's rather impossible for you to have a need that I'm unaware of when a marriage is on six levels. Because I feel your need, I see your need, I understand your need. Now, that is accomplished by making your need as important as mine. 
so that my thoughts are constantly receptive to what you're feeling rather than constantly competing for getting you to understand me. And at the top, when there is a blending of two souls, then the two souls in their purpose, in their direction, in their movement toward that direction, are inseparable. And the truth is, there is no such thing as a marriage apart from this one. Anything less is not a marriage. Which would illustrate, I think, that marriage is very, very rare. The only thing rarer than marriage is divorce. Because there is no divorce where marriage occurs, but marriage so seldom occurs that there's no discussion about divorce. So in anticipation of your question, is there ever a, a situation where divorce can occur? Well, if there's no marriage, it might as well. And if there is a marriage, you won't ask me the question. That's ideal. And if we were all masters, we could live according to the ideal. And if we're not, then we may have a belief that we have to settle for something less. If you have that belief, then you'll have to settle for something less. But you don't have to have the belief. What you can do instead is try to be aware of the sacredness of the energy within you. And understand this, anything that I would counsel having to do with sex or marriage is not based on ideas of morality or immorality. I don't have time for that stuff. That's man's manipulation of society for convenience. What I am concerned about is understanding the potency of the laws that we're dealing with. I wouldn't tell a person do something or don't do it because it subscribes to rules or violates rules. Rules are made to be broken or rules are made to be understood. And if the understanding of the rule provides a very good reason why the rule exists, then it's a good idea to obey the rule. And if you can understand what happens in the blending of energies between two individuals, if you understand well enough, then you'll use it productively. If you don't understand it well enough, then it's very dangerous to deal with it, obviously. You see, you and I are not physical vehicles. We're not masses of protoplasm. We're not solid matter. The matter that surrounds you is a result of the whirling vortexes of energy that you have set in motion. And when that energy is withdrawn from the body, it is nothing but cells. It is tissue and glands, but non-functioning. There isn't anything in the body that can make it function without that energy, without that life force, without the logoidal energy that brings it to life. Life force and vitality are the things that make life occur in this mass of protoplasm. We use it, we move it around, we manipulate it in order to communicate. Now, we can use it in a physical way to express energy. Now, the interesting thing about this energy that we have is that it lies dormant, or reasonably dormant, in the body at the base. When we come into physical matter, there is this energy pool, there is this potential. Of course, all of them are active, all of them are whirling. So, you know, the interesting things that happen in, uh, in, in metaphysics 
the metaphysical status symbols, you know, my heart chakra opened. And, um, you know, I've opened the crown chakra, and all of this business is, is a lot of foolishness. Your heart chakra is functioning, your crown chakra is functioning, all of your chakras are functioning, or you wouldn't be manipulating that mass of flesh, because that's what it requires. However, what you really want to know is, at what level am I functioning in my activities? Don't make a status symbol out of what chakra is opening. In, instead of that, make your value of life what you are giving value in life. If the things that matter to you are things that have to do with appetite and pleasure, things that give pleasure to the physical body, then your values all rest there. And if you come together to have a sexual experience, if you want to express a sexual experience, and if that experience has no purpose other than the pleasure of the physical body, then it cannot possibly express anywhere other than in these centers. And that's all right, except that it is then unavailable to activate these centers. So if you want to have a promiscuous sexual relationship, then by all means, enjoy it. But know that the energy invested in that relationship will keep your life experience bound up in this level, because it cannot rise beyond that when it is invested in this. When it is drained away at that level, it does not rise higher. If you want to activate the heart, then invest your energy through the heart. Now, you still can have a sexual relationship, but your sexual relationship will take on a new dimension. When I decide whether I'm going to have a sexual relationship or, or not, my decision should not be based on, does it tingle? Is it exciting? Does that really turn me on? Does the fantasy really get me going? All of those things are lower, lower level physical energy, physical appetite, sensory. They are, the fantasy is solar plexus stuff. The beliefs about it are solar plexus stuff. The physical expression is base chakra stuff. So it's all here. When I want to decide whether to have a sexual union or not, then I want to look at whether I can love this person that I'm coming together with in such a way that it increases my willingness to share that person and what we have together with everybody else without feeling that I must become exclusive with this person. I only want him if he is absolutely faithful to me and does not reach out, doesn't spend time with other people. You know, the most deadly thing about love relationships is, is this business of, yes, you can go there, but you better not have a good time. Now, I'm not talking about whether you're monogamous or not whether another person is having a sexual relationship or not. I'm talking about whether you have to be the person that causes all the pleasure that they experience. If they're having fun and you were not the cause of their enjoyment, does that give you a sinking feeling? Does that make you feel threatened? If so, your relationship is on a selfish, pulling, possessive, manipulative level. And it hasn't reached a level of universal love, of real love. It's still body stuff, appetite stuff, emotion stuff. Now, I can, in relationship, form that relationship for spiritual purposes. And what I do is, instead of focusing on the emotional experience and the physical experience of it, I look at myself 
my body as a temple. This is an instrument that can express ultimate spirituality. It can express pure God. I look at your instrument. Your instrument is an expression of God in earth, made perfect by God's expression through you. I look at it as a temple. I look at the coming together as a sacred act. And the coming together is for children. No sexual relationship should ever occur for any other purpose than to have children. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hear me. Children don't have to be physical children. <laughs> okay? The children don't have to be physical children. The children of a relationship are the direction of the energy that the two of you built together. What are you, what are you going to invest it in? Now, at this point I'm going to be rather explicit with some of the things that I say. You may want to send the children out of the room. I want to try to describe, as nearly as I can, what is really meant by making a relationship sacred and giving it the ability of metamorphosis. The power of sex in the human is the power of transformation. Rising to its highest level, it can cause healing. It can manipulate the environment. It can cause changes in the earth. It was sexual energy that Jesus used to bless the, uh, the weather, to curse the fig tree, to heal the leper. It was sexual energy. But it was sexual energy used at its highest and its best. He took the creative force of the universe, which was within him, which could have been expressed in a flooding out of emotion and physical expression and appetite and entertainment at a sexual level. But instead of doing that, he brought it to a crowning level and used it to give energy to the change, the metamorphosis of himself and others. And when that energy is aroused through the crown, completely through the crown, then that energy can give new life to the body. That's how he resurrected the body. He took the energy that had, would have rested here and could have been wasted in enjoying the appetite stuff at this level, and instead he invested it all in bringing it to its highest form, and it overcame the flesh and then could reanimate flesh that had been destroyed. That's metamorphosis. That's transformation. Raises the dead. Just little things like that. Now, the primary thing that makes the difference is purpose. Think about this for a moment. If you have ever had a really intense sexual experience, then you probably realize that that experience focused your mind. When the experience began, you may have been aware of a lot of other things. When the experience built to its peak of intensity, there came a time in your mind when nothing else existed except that moment. And at that moment of intensity, your mind was totally focused on the one thing that was happening probably the most focused your mind has ever been. Is that right? The moment before orgasm, 
may be the most focused your mind has ever been on one single thing. If you have experienced that intensity of sexual experience, that's what it's like. Now, the next moment, unfortunately, <laughs> you let go of all of it. And it went out in a flood of release that unfortunately is debilitating to the physical body, debilitating to the available energy that could be invested in other things. What could you have done differently? Avoid the orgasm, build to that point and stop? You know, there are teachers in the East that teach to do it that way. And that's not what I'm going to counsel you to do. Aren't you relieved? Okay, there are teachers that say to do it that way, but there are other possibilities. What I'm going to suggest that you do instead is realize the magnitude of energy that you have built in the act and assign it purpose. In fact, you can even do a series of meditations yourself on the chakra centers in your body, and it helps to understand what they're for, what each level has to do with. This is my will. If I can, in the building of intensity of energy, assign that energy to the overcoming of willfulness, and the re resignation of my will to God's will, then what I do instead of turning loose of the energy at the moment of orgasm is I internalize the energy at the moment of orgasm. I let it go out my crown instead of letting it go out the first chakra. Then it energizes the centers that it goes through. Now, the difference in that is not physical. The difference in that is mental, purposeful, emotional. What I do is... I think where I want the energy to go. Instead of feeling that I'm turning loose, I feel that I am turning within, and I try to feel the energy move through me and through the crown. If it happens, you are in for one whale of an experience. A crown orgasm is the most incredible thing that could be described. First time I experienced that, I was laughing hysterically for about three hours. Just, I didn't know what to do with the energy. I mean, how do you control it? It was just, it was an incredible experience. And there's no reason for settling for anything less. What you do is make the body a sacred instrument. You focus on the chakras. You assign them purpose. For example, the, the first chakra is primarily concerned with survival. It is survival of the species as well as the survival of the individual. So it is physically reproductive. And it is the energy that insists on the survival of life. It is the survival instinct is seated here. Survival and reproductive instinct. The second level here is the control of the defense systems of the body which means cell reproduction. So both of these are involved with reproduction. One, the reproduction of the species. The other, the reproduction of cells and, and the repairing of cells in the physical body. So this is a healing level. This is the level that Edgar Cayce referred to as the Leiden glands or the Lydigian glands, the control of the defense mechanism, the healing mechanism of the body. Okay, so those two glands are for that purpose. When I focus on them, I focus on my survival instinct, that which makes me look out for my own interest, and that which makes me uh, insist on wanting to continue survival and to promote the survival of the species. The healing level, the emotional level. So... When I focus on this level, the third level, what I'm focusing on is becoming the master of my emotions, not the slave of my emotions. I see my emotions as being servants who work for me. 
They work for me. They do me do what I tell them to do. So I can give them faces. I can give them visual images. I can speak to my anger, knowing what my anger looks like. When my anger starts to get out of control, I image my anger and I say, Come here, I want to talk to you. You're supposed to be my servant. I want you to behave. I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do. Now, you are valuable to me. I don't want to destroy you. I want to make of you a servant, working for me and working for others, not working against me and not working against others. So I animate, I, I realize I am this universe populated and my talents and abilities have form and shape and substance that I can see. They are the servants within me. They're the students. They are the children that I am bringing up to be new energy, new, uh, new level of expression. So I can focus on the emotion chakra, the solar plexus, the ability to absorb feelings from other people. That which in me is activated by walking into a room where there is anger, I suddenly feel tight right in here because that chakra is working. So I get that center to cooperate with me. I say, look, I'm in charge here. I will open you when I want you to open and receive others' feelings. And I will close you when I don't want to receive others' feelings, or when I want to put out feelings that will change the atmosphere in a room. A sensitive person, a psychic, who walks into a room and is hit with a ton of negative energy, doesn't have to make accusations and say, oh, I can't stay in here, I'm too sensitive. That's ego stuff. Instead, the person who is in control of the center will put out a different kind of energy that will cancel the negative energy and recreate it and cause other people to feel more comfortable. That's when that center is becoming a servant. I think of my heart and I wonder, can I freely love other people without requiring that they earn my love? Can I love those who haven't earned it? Can I love them freely without question? And without wondering, am I capable of loving them or not? Of course I am. I simply love, and there's no question about my love. There's no question about forgiveness for a person who loves on this level, no matter what a person has done to me. If they come having a need, can I just drop that instantly and say, yeah, I'll help you, but first let's take care of what you did to me. Can you release love forgive and always be available to make new a relationship. Can you yield your will? You know, there's an interesting thing about willfulness. Sometimes we think, if I just do God's will, I mean, I know. I know what I ought to do, but I'm afraid that, you know, I can't take care of myself if I just release and do that. When you stop to think about pitting your will against God's will, it comes out so irrational, so stupid. How in the world can you compete with God's ability to look after you? How could you possibly say, I know that's what I ought to do, but I have to make a living? You're more capable of making a living for yourself than God is for you? There's something about that that's quite irrational doesn't quite work. If it is the will of God, that by its very nature says it is the best for you. There is no competition between your will and God's will. That is the ultimate illusion. There is no competition between your will and God's will. If your will is not the same as God's will, it's because you are uninformed. You don't have the same perspective that God has because God's will is what is best for you. That's the very nature of it. Then how can there be competition? Then if I can raise the energy that I produce in my body to work on that, instead of working on satisfaction of the appetites, instead of working on seeking pleasure as if that would produce joy, 
if I can instead work on harnessing my will by yielding it to God's will, then I bring the production of energy within me, the available energy within me, to apply to those lessons. And having controlled the will, and only after controlling will, hopefully, then I can open my sight to really see. So many people I know want to see auras. They want to read minds. They want to understand what other people are thinking and their motivations. But let me ask you a potent question. How would you get along if your sight were so sensitive that every time you meet someone who sticks out their hand with an enthusiastic smile, who hugs you, if you could see that while they are saying, I love you, they are thinking, you know, I wish you had dropped dead. If you could see the conflict in the jealousy that they're feeling, the accusations they're feeling, the hate that they can feel, and what they're putting out through their mouth, how would you handle it? Do we know what we ask for when we ask for second sight? That's the question. If I haven't acquired universal love and the overcoming of will, I am not ready for second sight. I'm not ready to see all that you're thinking at all times. Or make, it, make the illustration simpler. Supposing I could see a dreadful disease having its way with you, and I know that there's nothing that can be done about it, that that is what is happening in your life process. Could I see that and not be torn by a need to tell you or torn by a need to feel victimized and so on. Can I take responsibility for what I see? That's what I'm really saying. If we can make of servants these levels, then we can open the sight of this level. And then having done that, being able to see clearly, then we can open this, which is union with God, yoga. God consciousness at the top. Now, in practical terms, what that says is if you want a whole spiritual, supportive, productive sexual life, there are a couple of requirements for having that. One is that you devote and commit yourself and your life to what you came to earth for. There are all sorts of diversions. You didn't come here to accumulate wealth. You didn't come here to accumulate status. You didn't come here to get married and have three kids and to make sure that they make good grades and grow up to get distracted in what they came for too. That's not what you came for. You came here to become a master and if you get on with it, if you make that your prime focus, if you keep in mind that what you're here, what the energy is available for, is for evolution, for transformation of the animal you into the highest expression of you that can exist. And if that becomes your motivation for all that you do, it's your motivation for eating. When you eat, do you eat for the satisfaction of the appetite? Do you eat for the survival of the body? Or do you eat because the taking in of vitality can move you closer to your spiritual goal? Jesus said every time you take food and wine, take it in this consciousness that it is God living within me. That Christ is coming to life in me. So even eating, the satisfaction of that appetite can be, should be, a spiritual experience if it is to meet your goal for coming here. 
Now, I know that I'm setting the standards ridiculously high. I'm doing that quite deliberately to help you to understand that there's no good reason for setting them any lower. There's no rationality in setting them any lower. No reason to do anything else. Unless, of course, you want to reincarnate a few more thousand times on this particular planet. Well, it is delightful being here when you consider the alternative. Now, Okay. You know, I mean, think. Think what it would be like when you consider, shall I have an active sex life? When the answer to that is based on, can my sexual experience promote my evolution? Can that be an act for the specific purpose of lifting me into a higher and better expression of what I am and lifting the person I'm with into a higher and better expression of what they are. Can I invest the energy of that relationship in that? Can we agree that that's what we're doing together? Lifting each other to new experience, not building more possessiveness, not exaggerating and giving more energy and more focus to the satisfaction of appetite, but giving more reality, more life, more vitality, more power to my evolution. By all means, if the sexual experience can be assigned the purpose of giving power to your evolution, get on with it. Get together. Get together with ha someone who has common commitment. And make it intense. Do all of the things that you can do to respect and love the temple. You know, some questions that I was given to answer in the workshop asked questions like, is it all right to have all sorts of explorations, foreplay and so on, in the sexual experience? I mean, you shouldn't do it without it. I can't think of anything less healthy than turning off the lights first before you take your clothes off and keeping covered up and being afraid to show and share. Let your body be a sacred temple. It's fascinating, even with the stretch marks. fascinating, even with the rolls around the waist. It's fascinating. Touch. Touch all over. Make it an experience with scented oils from top to bottom. Totally explore, share, love. Without the slightest hesitation, without the slightest feeling of guilt. Let yourself come to the point of being totally comfortable with your lover, to touch every part. You know, there's a book that caused a great deal of controversy that came out a few years ago that is so mild by today's standards. But when I was in high school, boy, I don't know, it was the ultimate argument. It was called Lady Shatterley's Lover. Remember that? And, oh, I couldn't wait to get my hands on it, you know. I was a senior in high school, I think, at the time, and, and boy, we wore out the pages of certain sections, you know, reading them over and over and over. And as I remember, it described very tender scenes of this lady looking at and touching and communicating with his penis. She gave it a name. 
And it was tender, and it was beautiful, and it was right. That's the interesting thing. It was right. It was nice. Differs so much from the pornography that is produced today, because it was gentle, it was exploration, it was real, it was loving, it was free, it was healthy in its approach of one person's body to another. Not saying that the, the affair of a married woman, I think she was married, wasn't she, with the gardener, I'm not commenting on the rightness of that relationship, but the way that they approached the exploration of one another's bodies, the comfort of it, the freedom of it, the all rightness, the honoring of that body as a beautiful instrument. That's right. Okay. And doing that as a sacred experience, a loving experience, a spiritual experience, is the right approach. Now, it's not possible to make a spiritual experience out of something that's dirty. And if it has to be under the covers in the dark, then you've got two strikes against you already. And if you've grown up with images that make that necessary for you, if you have a terrible time overcoming that, sit down and talk about it. Talk it out until you can gain the freedom. Ask for help from your lover in gaining the freedom not to have to put those straitjackets on the sexual experience because it is a source of energy. It is a source of power. It is a source of expression of freedom in all these other levels. Gain that freedom to approach it. Be able to explore and touch and share your bodies in any way that produces familiarity, being comfortable with one another, feeling that I don't keep my body from you, I don't feel used by you. It's almost as if I lose the distinction, that's your body, this is my body. I can get to the point of saying, this is my body, I feel it, I feel what is in it. And I don't feel the separation of thinking, this is me, that's you, I blend with you. That foreplay, terrible word, that preparation for the blending of your bodies can be an important step in making it a spiritual experience. Keep that sacred honoring, ending the separation, blending energies before you come together for the act of love itself. And then when you do, be aware of your own chakras, of the possibility of using this, this intensity. And when intensity begins to build, think of it as power. We are generating, we are waking power, life, vitality, creative force. We are waking creative force. It will cause children. It will cause children of creativity. It will vitalize my own creativity. You know, there is something that has been discovered over and over and over and has been written about over and over and over through time, and that is men who accomplished a lot, women who accomplished a lot, were men and women of passion. And those who were dead sexually never did very much. In fact, the very reason for the promotion of celibacy among priests and spiritual people was for the purpose of harnessing that energy so that it would go out the crown instead of being expressed through the genitals. And the interesting thing is that in order to control that and become celibate, they refused to think that way, refused to allow the expression, and they killed it. And it didn't work, except in a few. Celibacy rarely works, because it winds up with the killing of the passions. And when the passion is gone, when the drive is gone, 
he is gone. That which awakens the right side of the brain is sexual energy, is vitality energy, is passion energy. Which doesn't mean that you have to be constantly sexually active, but it does mean that you must keep the passion of creativity, of vitality, alive to be invested in higher purpose. So, practically speaking, what do I do? I build to the highest moment of intensity, and I'm fascinated with the intensity of the building. I feel it, I get in touch with it, and then I think, what do I want this to do? I think of the chakra levels. I think of the accomplishment of spiritual purpose. Would that divert you from your fantasy? It doesn't have to. That's another question that came up. What about fantasizing during relationships? There are a couple of good things about it. It keeps the mental imagery alive, the ability to see, the ability to use right brain thinking. And if your partner would be insulted if he or she knew that you were fantasizing someone else, and if that's going to produce guilt in you, then you probably ought to understand that that fantasizing is not unfaithfulness because you are using what other people represent, what you have discovered an element in one or another person that seems to be missing in you or your lover and you are incorporating it in you and your lover's life. You are borrowing it from there and investing it here. By all means, fantasize. Make it a part of your experience. But at the same time, keep in mind your purpose for the relationship. And as the intensity builds, begin to say, I want to bring my energy to a new level, a new higher level, and I'm going to try to feel it in my heart. At the moment of orgasmic release, I'm going to try to feel the opening of my heart and see how it feels here, instead of trying to feel it in the genitals. And I try to feel the excitement here as I feel it in the genitals. And I try to feel more excitement here than I feel in the genitals. I try to feel the intensity building, opening, flowering. Now, what I've described to you there is the basis for a practice called Tantra or Tantric Yoga. Um, that's the Indian version of the application of this, but it's also been practiced in the temples of Greece, in the temples of Israel, in the temples of ancient Egypt. It's been practiced wherever people recognized that creative energy is vital energy, it's God energy, and it can be given higher purpose. It can renew your mind. I know a young man whose strict Catholic upbringing has been so successful in turning him off to sex that he's completely avoided sexual fantasies and masturbation in his life. I wish you could see what it has done to him mentally and emotionally, and I hope we can repair it. The passion has been killed. He's not sharp in thinking. He's not creative. He's rather, well, dull, slow, almost retarded. And I'm utterly convinced that it is the lack of the awakening of the creative energy to get to the consciousness, to get to the brain. There is an extreme both ways. I can let my sexuality go in a flood of appetites and passion and drain it all away and waste it. I can inhibit it and kill it. And between those two, there is the stimulating of it, the appreciating of it, making it sacred, making it alive, and investing it with sacred purpose. And surely that is the way to use your sexuality.